I want to thank you all for your service to our country. Uh, as, as was said, my name is Richard Grenolch. I'm the 67th Commandant of the Second Company Governor's Foot Guard. And I've been asked to talk about the Governor's Foot Guard, but I'm also going to talk about the other units of the Governor's Guards. Uh, a little bit about, about how we were formed, what our history has been, and what we do today for the state of, and citizens of Connecticut. So, uh, sorry. okay, what is the Second Company Governor's Foot Guard? Okay, thank you. All right, we are part of the organized militia of the state of Connecticut, and here we have representatives of all four units, and we'll go into more detail on that. Okay, this is where we fit into the, uh, and we've I've already had some questions on where we fit in to uh, the military. Um, we come under the Connecticut Military Department, and if you see over here, you've got the National Guard with the Army National Guard and the Air National Guard. You have something called the Unorganized Militia, which is, uh, hasn't been called up since the uh, American Revolution. But we have something called the Organized Militia. And under the Organized Militia, there's a Connecticut State Guard, there's a Connecticut State Guard Reserve. Now, primarily what they do is a lot of the funeral details. Uh, a lot of uh, they're unable to get National Guard or Army uh, personnel to do a uh, particular funeral. And so it would be members of the uh, Connecticut State Guard or the uh, Connecticut State Guard Reserve, the difference being the age. Um, if you're over 64, you're in the State Guard Reserve. If you're under 64, you could be in the Connecticut State Guard. There aren't too many people in the Connecticut State Guard that are under 64. There are also four companies of the uh, state militia referred to as the Governor's Guards. And uh, we could turn the slide at this point. Okay, what is our purpose? Essentially, we, we uh, engage in military, historic, and ceremonial events, both public and private, to exemplify our unit's tradition of patriotism, volunteerism, and unbroken service to the state and country since the 1770s. Uh, that this, uh, well, the reason it says the 1770s is the first company was formed in 1771. Uh, the Governor's Foot Guard also supports the military department during emergency response and community service activities. Okay, and like I said, there's four units of the Governor's Guards, and we can turn. Okay, we got the first company, Governor's Foot Guard. Okay, this is them in Hartford marching for a St. Patrick's Day parade. We can turn. Okay, this is their headquarters on High Street in Hartford. Okay. And here's a welcome home vet Vietnam veterans uh, ceremony that they were involved in. Okay. We have the second company governor's foot guard, and that's our seal. Um, the dates are important, which I'll explain as we go along. Um, okay. Turn. okay, this is us at St. Patrick's Day uh, parade. Not this past year, because it was so rainy that I had to pull the unit out. Um, and this is us in our BDUs in Brantford. Again, another parade, okay. Again, go ahead. This is at our headquarters in Brantford. Um, again, our BDUs, this is the, the uniform we currently drill in, though we've recently been approved to switch over to the OCPs. And this is our band at a concert at Kennedy High School in uh, Waterbury. And what's interesting about this is there's several different uniforms here, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But we have the band in one uniform. We have the field music here in another uniform. We've got the color guard. And then it just happens the narrator happens to be me in my blues. We all, we all have quite a few uniforms in the unit. We have the first company, Governor's Horse Guard. Someone mentioned they like horses. And uh, it's a picture of them last year. Okay. At their headquarters. This is where? Oh, I'm sorry. Their headquarters is up in Avon, Connecticut. They were originally formed in Hartford. They've moved a couple times. They've been up in Avon for my lifetime. This is at camp. This is, happens to be their guide on. Uh, as you see, there's a helicopter. We were able to uh, ride in the Blackhawks this year at uh, 
Camp, uh, what is now known as Camp, Camp Net at Niantic, at that time it was Camp Niantic. Okay, turn. And this is them at the state capitol. Uh, this isn't for the, the last inaugural, this goes inaugural back further, so, okay. And then we have the second company, Governor's Horse Guard. They are located in Newtown. For many years they were in Bethany. Again, they were formed originally in New Haven and then ended up moving you know, around. You know, it's very difficult to keep the horses in the city, so now they happen to be in Newtown. Now the reason there's four units, um, two foot and two um, uh, horse guards, is that Connecticut had between 1700 and uh, 1873 two capitals, Hartford and New Haven. And in fact, New Haven was a far larger city than Hartford for most of that history. And what would happen is the governor would shift his residence every year and go to the other town, and the legislature would meet both in Hartford and New Haven. Of course, in those days, the legislature only met maybe one day, two at the outside, and uh, um, there was not the bureaucracy there is now. You know, you'd had a governor move with maybe one or two secretaries, and that was it. So. We could turn. Again, the horse guard, this is the more traditional uniform that they wear. That other uniform was their dress. There are a lot of St. Patrick, though. This one is a, uh, by that flag, would be a Columbus Day parade. Okay, here's the horses. Okay, okay the origins of the second company go to foot guard. 1771, it was decided in Hartford that there needed to be a body of gentlemen to protect the legislature and to be on call for the governor in case of any emergency. Now, if you remember, about this time, um, there was unrest starting to occur in the colonies, and the relationship between the uh, colonies, especially Connecticut and uh, Massachusetts and the uh, mother country, England, uh, was becoming to become frayed. And so Jonathan Trumbull, next slide, who was the uh, governor at that time, and also the governor during the American Revolution, uh, authorized the formation of a company in uh, 1771 in Hartford. Um, interesting enough, though this is jumping out a little further, Governor Trouble is the only governor of the 13 colonies that went with the Patriot cause. All the rest of the governors were loyalists and even the elected governor of Rhode Island uh, was a loyalist. Uh, but so, um, I don't know if anyone's been out to the um, headquarters for Jonathan Trumbull out in Lebanon, but his war headquarters is uh, located out there, and there's a nice museum and so. So anyway, now that we had that, we had a number of individuals that wanted to form a company in New Haven, and they gathered in December, actually December 27th of 1774, and among the people that were there gathering that decided that we needed a company in New Haven was Ethan Allen. Okay, again, that, this is a more famous picture of him at Ticonderoga, and there's a reason why I put this picture of him in twice. So, again, Ira Allen. Ira, it's funny, Ira Allen is actually far more important to the history of Vermont. As a, both as a Republican as a state than uh, Ethan was, because Ethan managed to get himself captured during the early part of the invasion of Canada and spent many years as a prisoner of war. And Ira helped take over the uh, Green Mountain Boys along with uh, John Stark, and they were very instrumental in uh, uh, Vermont first becoming a republic. And um, so, but anyway, he was there at the original meeting for the Second Company Governor's Foot Guard and signed the petition. Okay, Aaron Burr, who later goes on to be vice president, and he'll have another connection to the second company, Governor's Foot Guard, uh, before we're done here. Okay, James Hillhouse, we all probably heard of Hillhouse High School. James Hillhouse was, became a U.S. Senator. Uh, now, these are all older pictures. We have no pictures of them when they were younger men when they joined the Foot Guard. And we had the guy that was the most instrumental in forming the second company governor's foot guard, Benedict Arnold. I share as commandant, he was the first commandant, I'm the 67th. Benedict Arnold uh, was a merchant, he was a pharmacist, 
He had many ships. He was, uh, at that time, very much against playing tariffs, uh, very much in the Patriots' cause, supported of the Sons of Liberty, and he uh, financed a lot of the, uh, or put in the, a lot of his personal money to form the company. Uh, so anyway, that's December uh, 27th, 1774. Petition goes up to the governor. Okay. On May 2nd, I know this is a little tough to read, but on May 2nd, excuse me, March 2nd of uh, 1775, uh, the law was passed, formation of the Second Company Governor's Foot Guard. And uh, the reason I put this up there, and I'm sorry I didn't realize it would be so hard to read, but if you know anything about the uh, history of New Haven, you'll find a lot of these names are recognizable. Uh, Daniel Bishop, uh, let's see, Pierpont Edwards, Ellis Townsend, um, Jesse Leavenworth, uh, Hezekiah Sabin, um, Let's see, where is, it, where is he? Beers, uh, I forgot his first name. Anyway, jo Joshua Newhall. Um, these are all names that become, uh, these are all prominent businessmen that were in the New Haven area, that these were the first 58 members of the second company. Uh, so this was formed in March of uh, 1775. It was decided at that time that they would have a uniform of red coats, you see in front of you in the pamphlet there, our uniform is very similar to what we were wearing at that point. Um, the reason it was red was red was a traditional color for Connecticut's organized uh, or, or militia units when they did provide uniforms, just as blue was the uniform that for most of Virginia's units. Uh, remember, the American Revolution hasn't started at this point. Uh, we're still part of the uh, you know, British Empire, even though the relationship is getting worse and worse and worse. Okay. Powderhouse Day, 22 April 1775. Okay. Okay. When news of the Battle of Lexington, and turn again, and also from Lexington, arrived to the city of New Haven. Now, Lexington and Concord happened on 19 April. Uh, 1775, the news arrived in New Haven on 21 April. So some people were, and, and the name is unrecorded, rode rather fast to get the information here. The city fathers at that time decided to take no action but to wait to find out what exactly was happening and what the situation was and wanted to await more uh, information. But Benedict Arnold was not a patient man. And he gathered at that time the 62 members of the second company. And they took a vote. And 58 of them voted to march to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where the, uh, the, the Patriot Army was forming. However, even though they had their muskets and their bayonets and their nice red uniforms, they, they were short of gunpowder, they were short of flint, and they were short of ball. Now there was a, a powder house in New Haven, so that was decided that they would go to get the powder house, get the powder at the powder house. Now this is, gives you an idea of the New Haven green. It's actually from the 1820s, so it's several years later. It's after uh, New Haven has become the Elm City, so you see the elm trees. But it gives you an idea. There were the three churches there on the green. Uh, Yale University is in the back there, though right now it's a lot larger now, Yale, and uh, a lot more built up. But you can still see under the trees where it is. Good turn. Okay. What ended up happening is um, I, we, the foot guard formed on the green, and it ran into the Reverend Edwards, who was at the center church of the green. And he suggested that the second company come in and pray on the issue because, you know, most of the personnel back then were Congregationalists, uh, especially in, in New Haven. Uh, they were, for the most part, devout. And so it was thought that they would, should pray on the subject. So they go to the center church. Okay. This is our chaplain because every year, and we're going to talk more about this, we reenact this. So we go as part of the ceremony, we go to the church, 
and we uh, have our uh, a prayer, and we also have our necrology for the members that we've lost over the years. I'm sorry, that's out of order. Uh, anybody remember Richter's? Yeah. Okay. Richter's will be the location of which we're marching to, and I'm sorry that's out of order. It's out of order by two slides, so it's not a huge thing. But we're, the selectmen were meeting at Beard's Tavern, and Beard's Tavern, and by the way, Beard was a member of the second company, but Beard's Tavern, where they were meeting, is where Richter's is located now, and what was the Taft Apartments. Uh, it's now called The Ordinary. There's actually several plaques in there commemorating us uh, for that. And that's also the location, by the way, that we originally were uh, asked to be formed on December 27, 1774. Okay. Uh, this is part of the church ceremony. I really like this picture because you can see the stained glass um, there for it. And this is at the necrology where they're reading the names of the uh, deceased. Okay. And giving the salute. Yes. Can you go back? Go back a back slide. Yep. Is there an armed person with a musket? Yes, there are. It, you, yes, yes. Um, he's definitely carrying a, a musket because when they first came to the wilderness, and that's what commemorates. Um, what I believe it's, uh, and I should have looked this part of it, but I believe it's Davenport, was the Reverend Davenport was the, was the gentleman in that particular picture. But yeah, they remained armed, and they would bring their weapons to the uh, meeting house, the church, for uh, any ceremony. So we actually leave our muskets outside because of you know, sensibilities now, yes. Okay, and this is uh, a group of us, and you see that we have a number of guests in different uniforms. The, the ones in reds are, are primarily us. Okay, this is a picture by Mort Kunstler, and it, it's actually a little bit reduced. I tried to, it's the same picture I gave you on the single sheet. Unfortunately, my color printer uh, decided to, uh, or I'd say copier, not to work, so I had to give it in black and white. But this was a picture, it's, it exists in the, um, City of New Haven's uh, City Hall. And of course, uh, there aren't a lot of pictures of, of, of uh, the exploits of Benedict Arnold that are allowed, but in this particular case, it's allowed. Uh, I particularly like this picture um, because it, it, it shows the Beards Tavern, which would be on what is now Chapel Street, and uh, shows the members of the Foot Guard and shows the town fathers there. Um, when Moore Kunstler did this particular uh, picture, the soldiers all represent people that actually were in the foot guard when he did the painting, which was about 19, I want to say 86, though I'm not positive. So I'll always be remembered in prosperity as long as that picture stays up, because <laughs> that's my picture in there. Okay. Okay. When they went to demand the keys, the first selectman rebuffed them, and Arnold refused to take no for an answer. And out then came Colonel David Worcester. Now, we all heard of Worcester Square and Worcester Park. David Worcester, who later becomes uh, one, at one time commander of troops in Canada and ends up fighting in the Battle of Danbury and, and Ridgefield and passing away there. But he, uh, he also tried to convince them not to uh, take the, uh, the powder. And if I may, I'm going to read some of, because uh, they actually uh, saved the uh, information here. And I, it's a little dark, so I'm just going to paraphrase it. Essentially, Colonel Worcester said to the uh, uh, Captain Arnold, we understand and, and, and of your patriotic act here, but wouldn't it be best to organize regiments? And the legislature will be meeting in a few days, and why don't we wait? Why the haste? And Arnold says, let other units follow where they can, but I will not waste a minute. I will take the powder if you won't give it to us, and none but God Almighty shall stop me. And the uh, 
Uh, first, or the selectmen at that time got a little nervous as the bayonets were going on the muskets, and uh, they were afraid there might be a little fracas, but uh, they decided to give the powder to the uh, second company. They took the powder, the flint, and other supplies, and then they marched to Cambridge. And on the way, they picked up Israel Putnam, who was a uh, famed French and Indian War um, fighter who ends up being a, uh, one of the first major generals in the uh, Patriot Army. And he will fight at uh, Bunker Hill and, uh, or Breed's Hill and the Battle of Long Island. And for many years, he'll be the commander on the, uh, uh, on the Hudson High, Highlands. Okay, turn. Every year we reenact this. We don't reenact it with a horse every year. Uh, this is the demanding the key ceremony at the uh, City Hall in New Haven. Okay. And that's one of my predecessors uh, playing the part of uh, Captain Arnold, which I've had the, the um, honor of doing for the last four years, and I'll be doing for the fifth time this year. Is this publicized? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And that's why I also gave you the information on it. When gave you the schedule. When well, this year it's going to be on the 4th of May. Normally we would have done it this past weekend, but doing it Easter weekend doesn't work. There were complications for the 28th. We're also working with something called Wake Up the Green. Uh, the proprietors, who are the guy, people that actually manage the green, because believe it or not, the green is not owned by the city of New Haven, but it's owned by a private corporation. Now they run it um, for the benefit of, of the citizens of New Haven. New Haven doesn't own it. But anyway, the proprietors have started this Wake Up the Green. They preferred to go with the uh, 4th of May as opposed to going this weekend, the 28th. I, I just think they didn't want to be up against the Daffodil Festival. But you know, that may or may not be true. But yeah, it is publicity. I will say this, uh, that uh, there will be press releases going out, but I'm not allowed to send press releases. The military department do that. We do things on the military department. We only act on military orders. I'm here under military orders because we are a military organization as part of the armed forces. So yes, there will be publicity, but that's why I gave you the handout, and I apologize again for it not being in color, but that will give you the times of when we will reenact this. Good turn. Okay, and we, uh, we always have a number of other individuals and other units to come and join us. Uh, we have units coming from Georgia, uh, South Carolina, uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York for the event. Okay, good turn. And this is just a, a group of different officers, a gentleman from the Horse Guard, uh, General McHale of the National Guard, another Horse Guarder, and um, former Commandant of the Second Company, and then myself. Okay, and just some of the enlisted personnel. And the flags, uh, I, I didn't have a better flag on it. The, the middle one's our unit flag, but ahead. Uh, this is, uh, at that time, Brigadier General, now General, Major General uh, Francis Ebon. He is the Adjutant General of the State of Connecticut. Here we were making him an honorary member at the uh, Ordinary, or the former site of the Richters, uh, which is where it all started. And uh, we have a banquet, and our band is playing at the banquet, and we always try to have a lot of fun, and this is a number of our members, not all of them, obviously, we couldn't fit them all in the uh, picture, but, okay. Okay. Uh, as you see, the Battle of New Haven is the next major thing, but what I should mention at this point is, the Foot Guard went to Cambridge, and they uh, stayed for approximately 28 days. At that point, a number of them joined other units because they were well drilled. In many cases, they became officers or non-coms of other uh, units. Uh, Benedict Arnold became a colonel in the Massachusetts uh, state troops. Uh, he would later meet up again with uh, Ethan Allen at Fort Ticonderoga and you know, went on to a very colorful and checkered history afterwards. Um, so he was only with the foot guard for a few months. The second commandant, or I should say the 
person that was in charge at that point was Ezekiah Sabin. I could not find a picture. None of us have a picture of him, unfortunately. Um, he served as acting commandant for, for about a year and a half and then became the second commandant. And um, in 1777, the third commandant of the Foot Guard who was elected, and to this day, by the way, we still elect our commandants and our officers in the uh, tradition of the militia, uh, was James Hillhouse. Okay. Okay, James Hillhouse there. Again, this is a picture of him as much older as a U.S. Senator. But anyway, he became the third commandant. Now, I don't know how well you can see this. Uh, I've been trying to get my hands on this particular document, but Yale won't give it up. It's his commission as the uh, commandant of the uh, Second Company Governor's Foot Guard. And again, it's signed by Jonathan Trumbull. Okay, turn. Okay, Governor, also Lieutenant General William Tyron. Tyron was the governor first of North Carolina, and then he was the governor of New York. He was forced to evacuate New York. Um, when the British came back, he came back with a vengeance. Tyron uh, believed in uh, taking the offense to the uh, uh, citizens of Connecticut with a fury. He's the one that led the attack that went to uh, Ridgefield and to uh, Danbury in 1777 to destroy Patriot supplies. During this period, uh, and we're talking 1777, 78, and 79, um, New Haven Harbor was host to a large number of pirateers. These were uh, private ships that were given a letter of marquee under what was the international law at that time where essentially they were given permission to be legal pirates against the British. And in return for this, they would provide so much of the whatever they collected, whether it be the ship itself, whether it be guns, whatever the supplies are, a percentage would go to the uh, colony of Connecticut. If it was a Connecticut marquee, or if it was the United States marquee, it would go to the United States. And so that was a real thorn in the... Um, British side. You have to understand that Long Island was occupied by the British the entire time, and there were attacks going back and forth, back and forth. If anyone's seen the TV series Turned, okay, then you're familiar with a lot of the actions that were going on. Okay. Lord Tyron decides that he's going to uh, teach those rebels, or the, as he would call them, uh, those uh, traitors, a lesson. So he decides to attack. Turn. And he decides to attack New Haven. Now, you probably can't see this very well, so I'll, tr I'll try to explain it. This is the New Haven Harbor as it existed back then. This is what would have been West Haven, or what is West Haven now, but in those days, it wasn't West Haven. It was part of New Haven. And this is Bradley Point, where the British are going to land here uh, under a General Garth. Over here, like Tyron, was also landing troops. And they were going to go up to attack. And up here, we have the Black Rock Fort. Um, many of you may know the location is Fort Nathan Hale. Um, and they were going to meet up and burn the city of uh, New Haven. Now, the foot guard was called out for it, and they were joined by a, a large group of Yale students. And interesting enough, the Yale students found as an ad hoc, ad hoc commander a uh, lieutenant colonel of the uh, Continental Army who was uh, on leave. And this man happened to be Aaron Burr. So now he's fighting next to James Hillhouse and his men, and uh, under the command of Ezekiah Sabin, who was our second commandant, who at that point was serving as lieutenant colonel. Turn. Okay, uh, Bradley Point, and I'm not an expert on West Haven, but this is the rough location where the British first landed. You turn again. And this is the plaque here where they... Uh, they first landed on that spot, and that was dedicated in 84. 
Um, I forgot to put a slide in, and I apologize. Anyone here from West Haven? Okay. Does anyone know what probably the most famous, not Route 1, but, or the Post Road, but uh, road or street is in New Haven? Oh, excuse me, in West Haven? Campbell Avenue. Campbell Avenue. Campbell Avenue is named after a British officer. He was a uh, third lieutenant in the Third Guards unit, and he's credited with saving the life of a uh, pastor whose uh, name escapes me at this point. And many people assume it was David Daggett, who was the former president of Yale. It wasn't. He was there during the battle, but what, it was a different minister. But anyway, Campbell is credited with saving the life uh, of this uh, uh, minister, you know, essentially saying to his troops, you're picking on an 80-year-old man. What are you doing trying to bayonet him? Uh, Campbell ends up dying. There's actually two monuments for him. There's one up in Allentown, who is where he's buried, and there's another one on the West Haven Green. I apologize. I, I forgot to put in a slide on that. So the British under Garth are coming up through that area. They're coming up to where the West River is, and that's where the foot guard, and that's where the... Uh, Yale's uh, students are, and a number of other militiamen are. Turn. This is Defender's uh, Monument. It's at uh, Davenport uh, Road in New Haven near the El Grasso Boulevard. And it signifies uh, two members of the militia and one Yale student. And it's roughly in the area where the only artillery piece that the that they had at, during this part of the battle was. And for quite some time, they held the British back. Uh, they actually blew up the bridge uh, that was there over the West River. So the British had to come further north and eventually did cross. Of course, the British were approximately 1,800 men to maybe the 250 uh, total patriots that were at that point. However, the alarm had been set, and more and more Troops were coming from the, um, you know, from from Wallingford and from uh, what would be the Cheshire area and uh, from Branford and that sort of thing. Turn. Okay, this is a uh, a painting of the uh, Black Rock Fort. It was a small fort. There was actually only 19 men in it, and they held out for hours against a number of British ships firing their cannons until they ran out of, of uh, ammunition. This is on the Townsend Avenue side of, the, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, New Haven. In turn, this is what the fort looks like nowadays. Uh, it's not a, the greatest picture, but it's from the back there. Okay. And there's part of, that's one of the cannons that would have been there. So the, so the British were coming up in a pincer movement like this, and they finally met in the center of New Haven. But unlike his promise, they did not burn New Haven. Now, there are several reasons why that may have been. One might be because the soldiers got, British soldiers got so drunk that they were incapable of following that order. More readily, there were several Tories in New Haven that convinced them not to burn it. What was happening also is you had large numbers of militiamen coming from the uh, various areas, like I said, Wallingford, Branford, Meriden, um, Guilford, um, to, to fight, and they were constantly sniping. So Tyron decided, it's getting too hot to here, let's withdraw. So they withdrew without destroying New Haven, took about 100 people from New Haven, most of them Tories, away. And then what they proceeded to do was head on to Fairfield, which they burned, and then they headed on to Norwalk, and they burned in the same uh, sequence. Uh, but New Haven fortunately survived at that point. Okay. Okay. I'm not going to bore you because, quite frankly, there's not a lot of details after. Well, there, there are details, but they're not as exciting when it comes to military history between the period of the end of the uh, American Revolution and uh, the American Civil War. With this exception, um, many of you may not be aware that most of New England was very much against the War of 1812. 
and in many cases refuse to cooperate with the war, refuse to activate their militia other than for self-defense. Well, the Foot Guard was called up a number of times in 1814 for a British fleet that was kept on going up and down the Long Island Sound, but they never landed here. Now, they did attack out in the New London area where there were quite a few ships on the uh, Connecticut, uh, I'm sorry, um, Old Saybrook and uh, uh, also the uh, Thames River out in uh, New London. It was the burning of the ships in Massachusetts That's right, uh, up the Connecticut River. Thank you. Oh, okay. We've marched with you many a time, so. So, yes, as you said, Essex and all, but New Haven itself was not attacked. 1814? Okay. So, let's go forward to the Civil War, 1861. Second Company Governor's Foot Guard petitions the uh, governor to uh, go to support uh, Lincoln's request for volunteers and, and initially for militia units. Um, it's denied. Governor says, no, I need your troops here. You know, we have a lot of people that we're not entirely sure are, are loyal. We need you here. So what ended up happening was, uh, Next slide, please. Oh, no, back one. There we go. Okay, it's not the greatest picture we have, but a Captain Garrish, who's right here, um, along with uh, 35 foot guarders, formed Company K of the 6th Connecticut Volunteers. Um, they were unofficially known as the Governor Guards. They weren't allowed to use the name legally, but they used it anyway. They served primarily on the East Coast. They served at places like Roanoke Island, um, they, um, they, uh, but they also served, very importantly, at Charleston. Okay. Now, as you know, or for those that are Civil War uh, you know, aficionados, they know that, uh, let's see, where is it? can't see with this light there. Anyway, Fort Sumter is right here. This is where the war started. Uh, it was the last occupied fortress in South Carolina. And in April of 1861, forces uh, loyal to the Confederacy or the state of South Carolina first opened firing and, and that started the American Civil War. Uh, the um, Union Army uh, attempted to blockade it both by a ship and also attempted to take uh, it under uh, uh, attack under land forces. So there were a number of different forts and there's a number of different battles that were fought in here, but the one you may have heard of the most, Fort Wagner. Fort Wagner is also known as Battery Wagner. Has anyone seen the movie Glory? Okay, Glory uh, shows the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, which was in the vernacular of those days a colored unit who led the attack on Fort Wagner. There were actually several attacks. The two days before, the 7th Connecticut was involved in another attack, that, which was unsuccessful. But then on, uh, in 18, July of 1863, the uh, 54th Massachusetts led an attack of six regiments. The first regiment was the 54th. The second regiment was the 6th Connecticut. Good turn. That's a model of Fort Wagner. It looked bigger on my screen, but uh, we, we got a better one coming up. Okay, this gives you an idea of the guns that were there. Um, and uh, so there are a number of guns. Uh, interesting enough, it's no longer there anymore. The sea has claimed that area. So. Okay, and this is just a picture of the 54th. Um, okay, give you context. Now, the 54th's attack was at this part. The 6th Connecticut was up here and managed to penetrate into the, into the fort. However, uh, it was unable to hold its position because the follow up regiments were unable to take it. So the uh, colonel died. Um, his name was Chafin. Um, I should have mentioned earlier, Garrish and one of our prized possessions is, is his diary uh, during this uh, Civil War period actually dies of disease during this uh, period. 
Good turn. And there's another picture of the glory. Okay. This is General, General, excuse me, General Alfred Terry. He was a Connecticut resident. He was uh, the commander of the 7th Connecticut Regiment. Uh, at his own expense, he got Spencer repeating rifles for his unit. And uh, the reason he's here is after the Charleston campaign, the uh, 6th and the 7th Connecticut were both commanded by him in, in a, uh, a brigade. They spent, again, most of their time on the West Coast. At one point, they were part of the Overland Campaign um, against the uh, Petersburg, um, more so in the Bermuda 100 area. If, again, if you're familiar with Civil War, we won't go through all the details on that. Go ahead. He is most, in, ter actually, Terry's got known for two things. Second most important thing he's known for is taking Fort Fisher. Fort Fisher was the last fort that was defending the port of Wilmington, North Carolina, which was the last open Confederate port. At that point, there were no open ports left of, uh, worthy of name where the, um, any supplies could be brought into the uh, uh, Confederates. Turn. And there's a picture of what Fort Fisher looked like. Interesting enough, Alfred Terry's his most famous claim to fame was he was George Armstrong Custer's immediate commander during the Little Bighorn campaign against the, uh, the Sioux Indians. And he's the one that said, you know, George, why don't you take the Gatling guns? Or George, why don't you take these extra, we have three companies of the Second Cavalry, where George Custer wanted to do it his way, and we know how that ended, ended up. But he was a Connecticut resident and uh, very well thought of uh, during the Civil War. Okay, again, Fort Fisher, okay. Okay, I'm gonna talk, before we get there, just very briefly, because I was asked this question before. Um, in 1903, when they reorganized and created what we know now as the modern National Guard, and most of that was in reaction to, one, what was happening in Europe in terms of mobilization and the wars that were occurring there, the Franco-Prussian War and the Russo-Japanese War, but also, more importantly, um, with regards to when all these militia units attempted to uh, become available for the Spanish-American War, they found a lot of their training was wanting. Many of their officers were more socially connected than military uh, the, uh, adept. So in 1903, they created essentially what's the National Guard. And most units of what we know as militia became part of the National Guard. However, the Governor's Guards of Connecticut did not. They remained separate and under the control of the Governor. Interesting enough, that was more the Governor's doing at that point than it was the actual units. So, um, so that's why we remain separate from the National Guard. That being said, during, during excuse me, the Mexican expedition in 1916, when Pershing led troops into Mexico to capture Pancho Villa, um, the two horse guard units uh, were brought into the National Guard at that point as cavalry. And when World War I occurred, they were immediately dismounted and turned into uh, machine gun units. Um, they later served as, uh, and I forget which is which, but one served as an anti-aircraft battery and the other served as a coastal artillery battery. They then subsequently after World War II reformed themselves as cavalry units. But the two foot guards have always remained independent. So obviously they didn't serve in any combat function. What they did do during World War I and World War II was guard places like uh, you know, the Pratt Whitney's and, and the uh, Winchester's and, and the various um, important sites. Um, most of their younger members would have either volunteered for regular service or been drafted. So it would have been basically those that had, for example, during uh, World War II, most of the foot guard was made up of World War I veterans that were too old to serve. Um, it, it should be pointed out that at any point, uh, two thirds to three quarters of our members are veterans. And I would say right now two thirds are. 
when I came in in 81, it was almost 90% because we had a lot of World War II veterans. So that being said, I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about what we do today. So one of the things we do is a lot of parades. This happens to be in Bradford. Uh, again, it's St. Patrick's Day, you can tell by the flag. Okay, this was in Newtown. I don't, uh, I think this is part of Greenwich, but I'm not positive. Okay. Big E. Uh, we, we uh, every year have to march all four units along with the Adjutant General and uh, at Big E. They're always big on that. And then sometimes we end up having hazardous duty. Um, the reason I actually put this in, I just did want to give a little story that uh, many years ago we actually did march in the uh, Miss America pageant back in uh, when it was in Atlantic City and it was a torchlight parade on the boardwalk and it was rather, rather interesting. Of course you had to wait many hours uh, to get started but the unit next to us was the Philadelphia Eagle cheerleaders so it was very hazardous duty at the time. <laughs> Um, over the years, I've done parades in Dublin, Ireland, and uh, uh, Galway for St. Patrick's Day. We've done New York for St. Patrick's Day. We've marched in presidential inaugurals. We just marched in the governor's inaugural. In fact, I had the honor of escorting the governor in this year. Um, they wouldn't let me take my sword out. You can decide what I mean by that. Um, they. Uh, We've marched everywhere from uh, uh, West Virginia to Georgia to marched into uh, Fort Sumter and the Citadel. Uh, we were at, two years ago, we were in uh, Fayetteville at Fort Bragg, um, been in Annapolis, uh, Boston, every year we march. So we, we march in a lot of different parades uh, for a lot of different reasons. And uh, this is part of the Combined militia review every year. We have a review of all four militia units. They gather at different units, have uh, different years of hosting. This year we're hosting it in Brantford on September 14th. Uh, with your permission, I'll email you the information if people want to come out and see it. Uh, it's, it's, it really is quite something to see all four units uh, all together and the horse guard on horses, and uh, it usually brings a number of the um, uh, National Guard personnel. Okay, turn. We do a lot of color guards. Um, you can turn it. Fenway Park, 2012. Again, in 14, you can probably see it there. And you can see here, it was actually quite, quite neat because I was leading this one to see yourself as they're doing the national anthem. You're looking out the eye and you can see yourself on the camera there. Um, unfortunately, the Yankees haven't asked us yet uh, to do it. However, I don't think the Red Sox are going to invite us again because they've lost every time we were there. So, uh, in fact, I remember this one in particular because the, uh, the Yankees were, uh, were, were on the third base side. The Yankees were uh, uh, you know, stretching and, and throwing the ball around. And Derek Jeter came over and said, nice uniform. I said kind of under my breath, you're wearing a nice uniform too. Go Yanks. So go ahead. Okay, this, and I'm sorry the writing didn't come out, but I'll explain to you. Two years ago, they opened a new museum for the American Revolution that's dedicated only for the American Revolution, and that's in Philadelphia, right near Liberty Hall. And we were invited to participate. There were a, a, a unit from each um, state that was invited. And what they decided to do for Connecticut is they sent two individuals from each company. So there's members of the first and second foot and second first and second horse there. Um, and again, I'm sorry I didn't pull it out, but this is our unit flag here. And you see the horse guards. It, it's actually a good uniform. You see the difference between my uniform and my compatriots. It's slightly different. It's very close, but it's, it's slightly different. And then the horse guards wear what's a more traditional blue uniform uh, with the yellow stripe, but, but the riding boots. And then there's General McHale again. He seems to get around a lot. Okay. This is just a color guard. This actually goes back a few years because we no longer have this uniform. When the United States Army stopped um, issuing it, uh, it, it gets tougher and tougher to get parts for it. So we've discontinued this uniform. 
Uh, and we wear the blues more often if we're not wearing the reds on that. Okay, turn. This is a color guard action from the 1920s I found up in Boston. And it's up at the uh, election of the Ancient and Honorable Company of Artillery. They're the oldest organiza military organization in the United States. They were formed in 1638 uh, in continuous service. Um, they uh, are powerful enough that they stop on a, the first Monday in June traffic in Boston for their drumhead election on the Boston Common. Uh, but anyway, this, uh, this was a color guard back then, and you see the uniform hasn't changed a lot in the last, you know, since the uh, uh, 20s. In, fa in fact, the uniform we're wearing now was primarily adopted in the 1880s, okay? A Block Island Parade. This happens to be our summer uniform. Uh, it, it's meant to be a little cooler. It really isn't. It's a lot easier to put on, but it's uh, not that much cooler. Go ahead. Uh, Cape Cod. We do the uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade. We have a field music or fife and drum corps, though the trumpeters snuck in there. So go ahead. Fife and go ahead. Yep, and our, our field music. Okay. And we have a band. This again was Kennedy High School. Uh, we could turn. And another concert. And this, is, this was up at the Northford Church. And here, here's the band marching with us, again, in the summer reds, so, okay. We do advanced training. I had to redo this because it actually said Camp Niantic. And for those that remember, it was always Camp whatever the governor was. And Governor Malloy decided we couldn't afford to change the sign every four years. Um, so they, it became Camp Niantic and then became a battle. This year it was rededicated as Camp Net named after Robert Nett, who was the uh, Medal of Honor winner. Uh, the other major camp is Camp Hartel, which was also rededicated this year, who was also named after a Medal of Honor winner. So th this is the uh, four guard units. We're actually at the range in East Haven. Okay. And uh, one of uh, our members being promoted, um, that's General Yvonne, and uh, you can turn. This is at the FATS Training Center in uh, Niantic. This is where we use simulated either M4s or M16s. Um, what ends up happening is it's compressed gas and it's laser targeting. So you would do this before you actually do the live firing. And some instruction, and you can see one of the guns there. They also have the, uh, the Beretta pistols there, though they're switching over to the Six Sours. We've actually been armed with Six Sours ahead of the uh, National Guard, which is creating a few difficulties, but we paid for them ourselves. So, okay, this is us, uh, or some of us at uh, AT, getting eagerly waiting to get onto the uh, helicopters. Um, and you can see in the back there a tank, uh, I believe that's a M48 Patton, but I'm not positive from this angle. Okay, uh, we still do a lot of musket drill. Um, we would do the musket if we were out in the audience. We'd do it in the Reds, but we practice here in the, uh, uh, you know, the BDUs, and you can see the ear protection and the safety purposes. This is Niantic. Okay, again, doing that sort of thing. Yep, this is me uh, actually a few years ago demonstrating how to load it inside. Okay, we got to fly in the uh, Blackhawks this year, which was a lot of fun doing some of the nape of the uh, ground. Um, uh, training and then along the coastline. Um, as the general said, well, my pilots need flight hours, so you might as well have somebody in it when they're, they're flying the helicopters. Okay, community service. Here we were at a uh, dinner for World War II veterans in uh, Hamden a number of years ago. Okay, uh, flag folding for funerals. We trained to do funeral details, both with weapons and for the flag folding. My executive officer, Joel Hurlman, uh, he's former police chief of Shelton and uh, demonstrating how to fold the flag. Uh, search and rescue, uh, we do training for that. Uh, we've actually not been called out for it, but we are available in case uh, something, someone needs to be found in the woods. Of course, this group here looks more like they're lost. 
just the way they're looking right now. So that wasn't my group. It was, mine was the other group. But anyway, go ahead. Uh, training in the, in the uh, New Haven, uh, excuse me, in the Brantford. This is a new thing that we've just taken on. It's the mobile field hospital training. Uh, Connecticut has these four mobile hospital units. And uh, the last time they went to deploy it, they realized they didn't really have the manpower to do it. So the mission has been given to the organized militia. And so we've been training now for the last three months to setting these things up. Uh, now, why would they be called up? I don't know if, if you realize, a few years ago, a gentleman rammed his car into the uh, uh, Middletown uh, Hospital, specifically the emergency room. They went to deploy this, but they didn't have all the parts and all. So now they've dedicated to us. First thing we did was inventory the parts. And then two, three weeks ago, we started erecting it. Turn. Just more of it. Turn. This is one of the uh, power generators. Uh, there's six trailers for this thing. It takes, with perfect numbers, it'd be 36 uh, people to, to put this uh, tent unit up. It's rolling out a section of it. This is the tent section, and I'll show it to you again. The main section is actually on wheels it starts with. It's pretty neat. You, you bring it out. You, you have to set the floor out first, and it rolls out on the floor. And then, oh, no, I missed a thing. OK, I, I thought I had the bladder one, and maybe it's in the wrong place, and I apologize if not. But there's a bladder that blows it up. And then we build the frame, and then blow the, the bladder comes down. OK, this is AED, AED uh, training. That's Captain Clark that I know you've communicated with initially. I don't know who he's pointing at at that point. But we're practicing our, uh, that's the defibrillators. So, so we do the CPR training, and we have a defibrillator we march with. 